and we will finish 1 Timothy. We'll actually finish something that we began here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're going to be in verses 6 through 12. When you find that, if you would not mind standing with me to honor God and his word. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, or food and clothing, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Gracious Heavenly Father, Sovereign Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that Timothy took the time to write this letter. Paul took the time to write this letter to Timothy to instruct him in the word. And we have it with us today. According to your will, according to your divine purpose, perfectly preserved for our instruction. We give you praise, honor, and glory, and we are eternally grateful, Lord, for how good you are to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. I'm going to begin this evening by uh, putting this out there. When it comes to verse 6 here, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I understand the nature of what Paul is saying, but I have yet to experience this truth in its fullness. And I want to explain what I mean by saying this. Now, the word godliness here, it means the state of being godly or truly devoted to Christ. Uh, That's what the word devout means, as in she is a devout Christian or he is a devout Christian. It means truly devoted to Christ. And the word contentment means not desiring something more. It means to be satisfied. And now I can say with complete honesty that I am a devout Christian. I am genuine in my belief in Christ Jesus, in my faith in Christ Jesus, and through Jesus I have been sanctified, I am justified, I am a new creation in Christ, therefore I have attained to godliness which only comes in Christ, so I understand that I have experienced the first part of this verse, godliness, but it's that last part, with contentment. That is what challenges me. That, I believe, has escaped me somewhat. Now, I'm not saying that I'm discontent, just that I've never been content in any way whatsoever in any area or facet of my life. I have never known complete contentment. That is, never known the desire to not know more. Now, I sat down to study this scripture, and... um, After having obtained this uh, understanding of what it means to be godly, after having studied what it means to have contentment or what contentment consists of, I sat down and asked myself, I did a little introspection, I asked myself some hard questions. Questions that I would this evening put to everyone here. Questions such as, are you content in life? Are you content in your marriage? Are you content in the ministry to which God has called you and equipped you and placed you in? Are you spiritually content? Are you content with your relationship with Jesus Christ? And considering all of these different areas of our lives, can you honestly say that you are content, which means having no desire for anything more? And of course, I'm being completely honest with you. I believe that's the way we ought to be. I'm not going to stand up here and present something that is not untrue and try to present myself as something that I am not. With these questions in mind, listen, my answer to all of these questions concerning contentment in every area of life is, as in, am I content? The answer is clearly no. I am not. I desire more. Now listen, I'm not content in my marriage. I'm not content in the ministry. I am not content in every area of my life from this understanding of not having a desire for something more. Because, because, listen, I firmly believe that we are called as Christians to live life to the full. 
And so if there's something more which I can experience or which might be added to my life that's going to make it more interesting, more exciting, more worth living, I desire that. And so I can not honestly affirm that I'm content in life. I desire more. I always have desired more. I, I firmly believe that marriages ought to grow. And so my, rela my relationship with my wife, it's not a static thing. It's a living thing. And the joy of growing old with someone is growing together in maturity and in love. And the joy of marriage is in experiencing the seasons of life together. And seasons change. So I cannot be content in my marriage as long as there's something that might be obtained, uh, something that might be added, something beneficial, which would make it even more fulfilling. Do you understand? Amen. The same holds true for the ministry. The same holds true in being a pastor. The same holds true in my relationship with the Lord Jesus and spiritually speaking. I don't find myself content with things such as they are. Now, I'm not disappointed. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm not disappointed in any of these things. I'm not disappointed, just not content. Because I believe that there's always one step higher that we can go in every area of our life. We can, always, we can always move up. We can always move forward. And listen, when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ, when it comes to our relationship with God our Father, the Creator of heaven and earth, we can always take one step closer to God. And as long as this is true, I find that I will have a holy discontent. Now, I don't believe that I'm talking about contentment so much as I'm talking about becoming complacent. There are people who confuse contentment with complacency. Being complacent means being self-satisfied. Self -satisfied. That is, you reach a point in which you say... This is it. This is as far as I want to go. I'm satisfied. I don't want anything more. Even if there is something more, nope, this is it. That's complacency. And people confuse contentment with complacency. And, and, and when you become uh, complacent, that leads to apathy. Okay? The person who's complacent, the person who is self-satisfied with their life, they don't look to grow. They don't want to move forward at all. They are exactly where they want to be, even though things could be added, even though things could be better. They say, no, thank you. I'm good. I got everything I want. That's complacency, not contentment. And some people confuse complacency with contentment. They believe that they are content in life, but the fact of the matter is they're simply being complacent. Now, all of this that I'm sharing with you this evening... That was weighing on me as I was reading the scripture, as I considered what Paul had here written. But godliness with contentment is great gain. I want you to know that I began studying this scripture two weeks ago, weighing all of these things. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So I took this holy discontent that I have about everything, and I took this verse, and I went to the Lord Jesus in prayer, and I, and I asked the Lord, I asked the Holy Spirit, please reconcile the two in my heart and in my mind. And tonight, I am going to share with you what the Holy Spirit taught me, and I want you to hang on because you're in for a ride. Amen? Amen. All right. Because God is good. Amen. And when he showed me some things tonight, I was like, amen, hallelujah, he lit a fire. I began by doing what I always do when I'm studying and preparing for a sermon. I went to the Greek New Testament. I wanted to see what the Greek word translated contentment in this verse is. Uh, I wanted to find out why it was translated as it is. And I wanted to further define the word. And so here's what I found. The Greek word in the verse is autokia. And that means being self-sufficient and content as such. Uh, Zadiades, Spiro Zadiades, Greek scholar, he said... This is in a good way, sufficiency in a good way, sufficient within oneself, spoken of as a satisfied mind or a satisfied disposition. So then what Paul is addressing here, he's not talking about being complacent. He's not talking about that complacency that leads to apathy. 
He's not talking about simply accepting things as there are and doing nothing about moving forward in life. Rather, he's speaking to being, and this is for lack of a better word, folks. I couldn't think of any, word, any other way to describe this. But Paul is speaking about being okay with where you're at in the different areas and stages of your life. So godliness with contentment amounts to being satisfied with where you're at. But there's more to it. It's not only satisfied with where you're at, but um, it is also being satisfied with where you're going. Amen. It's not about being static or staying in one place. It's about where you're going. Mm -hmm. Content, satisfied. Where you're at and where you're going. Godliness. With this type of contentment, that is being okay, being satisfied with where you are, but with where you are going. So we're still moving forward here, folks. The Bible doesn't say stand still. It's always move forward with God. Being satisfied with where you're at and being satisfied with where God is taking you. That's what godliness with contentment with great gain means. Amen. Amen. And so with that in mind, I wanted to apply this to some different areas of our life. Okay? So the Apostle Paul, he starts with physical needs. But godliness with contentment is great gain, and it applies to our physical needs and the desires we have in life. Physical desires. That is, things that we need for living this life. Look again at verses 7 and 8. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, food and clothing, let us therewith be content. Now listen... Being satisfied, being okay with where you are at, physically speaking, concerning the necessities of life in this world, in this age, it, it has to do with being okay with your provisions in life. And here Paul sets the standard fairly low, doesn't he? He says that all you need to be satisfied, to be content with where you are and with where you are going and with where God is taking you, all you need is to have some food and some clothing. He says, all you really need to be content in this life is to have the basic provisions of life. And my dad used to say it this way. You got food to eat. You got clothes on your back. You got a roof over your head. What more do you want? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he said that every time I ask him for money. Hey, dad, can I have money? <laughs> what do you need money for? There's groceries in the kitchen. You got clothes on? A roof? Good job. Good job. So if you had... <laughs> Yeah, I did get a job. Thank you very much. <laughs> if I, I heard him say that, get a job. <laughs> you can even talk to, oh wait, I can't say that about Aaron anymore. <laughs> Praise God, hallelujah, Aaron's got a job. Amen. Where is he? Oh, there he is. All right. If you have godliness, which means if you are a child of God, you are sanctified through the Lord Jesus Christ. You are sanctified, you are justified through Christ and you have the basic necessities of life, then you have everything that you need to be content concerning the physical necessities of life. Amen. You have what you need to be content. Now, that doesn't mean that that's all that you are, that you're ever going to have. No, that's not what it means at all. Some, some Christians take this to the extreme and think that once you become a Christian, you've somehow taken a vow of poverty. No, you have not. We serve a good God. He's generous. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, being content with such things as we have, having food and clothing and shelter, that doesn't mean that that's all we're going to have. That doesn't mean that that's where we're going to stay when it comes to the physical necessities of life or even the, the desires of life, good things that, God, that, that are in this world that, that God could bless us with to make our life even that much more worth living. Now remember here, contentment is not complacency. So if you're like, well, you know, I got a job, I got, I live in a house, and I, I got food, and I guess that's all I want, all I ever need, or anything like that. That's not contentment, that's complacency. Contentment is being okay with where you're at, but also with where you're going, which means that it includes moving forward. And our God is a good God, and he has provided us with good things in this life to enjoy. Though they, they're not a necessity, they're not a necessity uh, they do make life a little worth, more, more worth living. Uh, they make uh, life a little easier on us. And, and, and these things, they're neither good nor bad. They are things which 
when God blesses you with, they're perfectly okay to have and then to enjoy. And so look, if God has given you more than the necessities of life, praise God and enjoy it. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm talking about things like, you know, you got a fishing boat and you like to fish, praise God. You, know, you like to drive a nice car and God blesses you with a nice car? Praise God. If your thing is, is uh, works of art and you own a couple pieces of art that bring you joy, praise God. Amen. There are nice things in life that can be had and having them is nothing short than God's blessing on his children with good things. But what you need to understand is they're not necessary to be content. That's where people get off track. They make themselves discontent because they don't have things that are really not necessary to be content. All you need to be content with where you are right now and where you're going and where God is taking you is the basic necessities of life. If you have the basic necessities of life, you can be content. You can be satisfied. You can be okay right where you're at and where God's taking you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. But God has not given us life to live in an endless pursuit of pleasure. God has not given us a life to live in an endless pursuit of wealth or an endless, endless pursuit of toys. People who, who think that, that life is all about just uh, getting it all that you can get. And they say things like, he who dies with the most toys wins. I got a saying that trumps that. He who dies with the most toys is dead. That's right. There are people, and they expend almost every bit of their livelihood. They go to the casinos, and they're chasing riches so that they can live what they believe to be the American dream. And they put all their faith and their hope in the lottery. If I just hit that lottery and God makes me super rich, all my troubles are over. So they go into the gas station... And they buy a lottery ticket. They put their faith and their hope in that lottery ticket. And then they go outside and pray to God and ask him to hit the numbers. That deserved a bigger laugh. Because that's the way people are. Do you trust in God or do you trust in the lottery? Come on, folks. What does verse 9 say? But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Modern translation in this verse with this phrase. These things lead men to loss and ruin. That's exactly where they're headed. Loss and ruin. The way of the world, listen, the way of the world, it always will build discontentment in people so that they will pursue the world to their loss, to their hurt, to their ruin. And I want you to think about this. You know, you're watching TV. I like that we have cable TV now so we get to pay for our advertising. It used to be you could turn on TV and it was free. Now you've got to pay for it. Advertising is designed to awaken in us a desire for something. So that we will take our hard-earned livelihood... And hand it over to someone else without reservation. Practic practically every commercial that you see on TV, listen, it's geared to make you miss something you don't have. But you can't miss something you've never had. Amen. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Verse 10, the love of money is the root of all evil. The Lord Jesus has promised to meet our every need. The Lord Jesus has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Which means no matter what our circumstances, what, no matter what they look like, whether they're real, perceived, or otherwise, no matter what the circumstances we face, God is never going to leave us, and he's not going to fail us. We have the promise of God's word. He's going to take care of us. He's going to give us everything that we need to live. He's going to meet our needs, not our grief. Amen. Sometimes, though, he does give us some nice things, doesn't he? That's because he's good. Amen. If you've got food, if you've got clothes, if you've got a roof over your head, you have everything you need to be content. You have everything that you need to be satisfied with where you are at and where you're going, where God is taking you. And so just trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Listen, listen, I promise you that the Lord Jesus is going to move you beyond just enduring life. 
He's going to move you beyond surviving day by day. He can move you from living paycheck to paycheck. He can move you to the place where he'll open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing there's not room enough to receive it. And my life is a reflection of that truth. Just go open the dead gum freezer at my house. Thanks to my wife. But you've got to pursue the Lord, not the blessing. Get that? You've got to pursue the Lord, not the blessing. Being content with such things as you have. Being satisfied, saying, I'm okay where I'm at right now, but I'm also okay with where I'm going. So godliness with contentment, that applies to the necessities of life. It also applies to our spiritual state. It also applies to our spiritual needs. Are you content with where you are in your spiritual growth? Are you satisfied with where you're going? Or maybe it's better stated, are you satisfied with where you're growing? Now listen, in Christ, you have the means to having every spiritual need met. Understand that? In Christ. in Christ, where you're at, the minute you're saved, you are okay. And you have the means to having every one of your spiritual needs met. Okay? But that doesn't mean that you need to be satisfied at one spot. Like I've preached before. Some people think that salvation in Christ is the destination. <laughs> no, that's the beginning. Amen. Amen. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yes, in salvation in Christ you have everything that you need to be satisfied with where you're at. But you also need to be satisfied with where you're going. And you've got to move to be going somewhere. Godliness with contentment is not complacency. It is okay. It is being okay with where you're at. But, but you still got to be moving forward with God. And so with this in mind, are you satisfied with where your relationship is with the Lord Jesus? Is it vibrant? Is it growing? Or is it some static thing? Have you reached a point where you have said enough? I mean, have you grown complacent? So, so uh, in your walk with the Lord Jesus, you're not feasting on the word of God. You're not coming into the church worshiping in spirit and truth. You're not growing. You're simply existing in your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Where at one time you might have had this dynamic relationship with the Lord. Now it's kind of stalled. How many of you ever felt like that sometimes? It's kind of stalled out. And you become complacent about it. I guess that's all there is. And then it leads right to what? Apathy. When you reach a place of complacency in your spiritual growth, you cease to move forward with Christ. And when you cease to grow and move forward with Christ, the only direction you can go is backwards. You see, when it comes to your relationship with Jesus, when it comes to your spiritual walk, when it comes to spirituality, you're either growing or sliding back. There is no middle ground. When you reach a place of complacency in your spiritual growth, you cease to move forward. And the only place you can go is back. And we call that backsliding. And if you're backsliding, you're not going to be content. If you're complacent, you're not going to experience contentment because I want you to understand this. You have been made to grow in spiritual maturity. Amen. You've been made to grow in spiritual maturity. My dad used to say it like this. He'd say, if, you, if your wife was pregnant, she went to the hospital and had a baby, and then they released her from the hospital, you wouldn't take that baby home, put, you know, put it in the car seat, drive home, pull that car seat out of the car, stick it on the porch and say, we're glad you're here, now take care of yourself and go in the house. Right? But that's what a lot of Christians do with their walk with Jesus Christ. That's why they're spiritually immature. Or if you brought home a baby, right, and that baby never grew, it didn't get stage one when it became a toddler and became a, you know, and then became a, a, ch a child and then became a, a, a adolescent and then a teen. If that if that baby just continued to be a baby all its life, what would you say? You'd say that there is something wrong with that baby, that it's abnormal in some way. And yet this is exactly how Christians are with their walk and their, and their relationship with Jesus Christ. They become complacent with just being a baby. That's abnormal. And if, if you are complacent, you're not going to be content because you've been made to grow. You've been made to grow. 
And to go in the wrong direction is going to cause you to be discontent. And if you're going in the wrong direction in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're sliding back, you're going to become bitter. Because you're going to start feeling left out. You're going to start feeling left behind. But you've not been left behind. You've not been left behind. You stop. You just quit walking with Jesus. And that boils down to you are the cause of your own spiritual discontent. Because the, Christian, the Bible tells us the Christian's walk is always forward and upward. Amen? Amen? The Christian walk is always forward and upward with Christ. Philippians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. This is the Apostle Paul. Brethren, I count not myself to have arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, listen, reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. The Christian walk is always forward. It's always upward. Amen. And what does, what does Paul write to Timothy in verses 11 and 12? But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Listen to what he says. Follow after righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Then he says what? Fight the good fight. And you got to keep moving. Stick and move. Fight the good fight. Then he says this. Lay hold on eternal life. Oh, what does that mean? Lay hold on eternal life. You know what Paul is telling Timothy? He says, I want you to go out and live life like it's eternal because for you it is. Live your life. Move forward. Live life like it's eternal because it is. Yeah. 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 Yea, this in him was the peculiar grace that before living he'd learned how to live. No end to learning. Earn the means first. God truly will contrive us, contrive use for our earning. But others mistrust and say, but time elapses. Live now or never. And he said, what is time? Leave now for dogs and apes. Man has forever. Time only means anything to people who are not eternal. The Christian's life is eternal. You've heard me say it before. I'll say it again. Christian said, I crossed that off my bucket list. What bucket list? I got eternity to do everything that I want to do. Live. You have eternal life. Go live. Hallelujah. Oh, God's blessed you with life. You have, not only do you have this physical life before you, you've got spiritual life. It's eternal. Mm -hmm. The problem is with most people when it comes to living life, uh, both physically speaking and the spiritual life that we have. Listen, the problem with most people is they're not living life. They don't actually pursue life. The problem with most people is they're simply enduring it. <laughs> Go up and ask someone, how you doing today? Well, we're getting by. No Christian should ever say, oh, I'm just getting by. You know, we're okay under the circumstances. What are you doing under the circumstances? You have eternal life. Get above that and live life. Amen. Most people just endure life. You know what they're doing? They're just sitting around waiting to die. Tell me if that's not true. You ever met someone whose life is just simply a reflection of someone wanting or just waiting to die? Go to the house, nothing ever changes. They never put any, they don't do anything to move forward. They don't do anything to improve their lot in life. They're not looking forward to the next chapter in their life. They're not looking forward to anything. They're just sitting there day after day after day waiting to die. You find them in the same place day after day after day. They've grown complacent. And now they're just nothing but apathetic. And they're pathetic. Waiting to die. Complacency leads to apathy. Which then leads to a life that is atrophied. Brothers and sisters, you're a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. You possess eternal life. So if you're sitting around waiting to die, you're going to be waiting a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Get it? If you're waiting to die, you have eternal life, yeah. you're not going to die. Know that. Amen. Get up! 
Get up, get out, start living. Live for Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Feast on life. Mm -hmm. It's a gift of God. Amen. Oh, to waste your life is a sin. Truly is. Stop being spiritually atrophied. Don't be apathetic concerning spiritual things. Be proactive. You get proactive living for Jesus, you're going to know contentment. You're going to know satisfaction. You're going to be okay with where you are. And you're also going to be okay with where God's taking you. You're going to be okay with where you're going. Because you'll be going. You'll be going. And as you're going, you'll be growing. And as you're going and as you're growing, guess what? You should, suddenly you turn around and you're living. Living. I don't understand Christians who are just enduring life waiting to die. This truth also applies to the calling that's on your life, the ministry that God has given you, that godliness with contentment is great gain. If you're okay with where you are in the ministry and also okay with where you're going, that's great gain. That's great. That's a... Uh, that brings satisfaction to life. That's when you know the sweet satisfaction only living for Jesus birth. The thing is to know contentment here in the ministry, to know satisfaction in the ministry, you actually have to kind of engage in the work of the ministry. Listen, just dreaming about doing something for God is not going to get you where you want to go. Just dreaming about doing something for God, that's not going to get you where you need to be to experience satisfaction and contentment in life. You know what dreaming does? Builds discontent. Dreaming does nothing but build discontent. Unfulfilled dreams do nothing but build disappointment and lead to dissatisfaction with life. That's not me, folks. That's the Bible. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Unrealized dreams will make you heart sick, but dreams that come true will make your life awesome. That is my unauthorized paraphrase of that verse, and you can use it if you want. Proverbs. Dreams that come true make life awesome. Amen? Proverbs, what was that? Proverbs, Proverbs 13, 12. Amen. Now, what I want to do is share with you how God can take a person's dream and turn them into a reality. And I'm not talking about those weird dreams you might have at night when you wake up and go, what was that? I'm talking about the dreams where you envision where your life is going. You know, that, that, that vision of yourself in the future where, you're, where you have arrived and you have accomplished everything that, that uh, you have set in your heart and God has given you in your heart. It begins with this. You've got to give your life to God and purpose it for His glory. If you want your dreams to come true, you've got to give your life to Jesus Christ and let Him use it for His glory. He knows the desires of your heart. That's why he said in the Bible, delight thyself in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Okay? See, God's not going to lift you up. He's not going to give you glory and make your dreams come true so that you can be the God of your own little kingdom. That's never going to happen. I mean, if you want that kind of life and you want those dreams to come true, go out to Hollywood or something. Because that's what they're doing. That's not what God does. But if you... Uh, you want, if you want a, God to make your dreams come true, then give your life to God and purpose it for His glory. You're only going to realize joy and satisfaction in life by God working in you. And when He works in you, what He does is He allows you to do what you love and want to do because He's a good God. He's an awesome God. He knows exactly what's going to bring your sweet satisfaction to life. And He's going to use that to bring glory to Himself. And that begins with the right heart attitude toward God. And when you, when you give your life to God and purpose it for His glory, then the Holy Spirit, He begins to guide your steps. He begins to guide your life. But to move forward, you absolutely must trust where God's taking you. So, so if you're going to realize the dreams that, God, that you have, the, the, the dreams that, that you envision, if God is going to bring you to that place in your life... Listen, you've got to purpose your life for God's glory. You've got to turn your life over to Him. You've got to let God start working in you. You've got to let God start guiding you. And if God's going to guide you, you've got to stop and trust Him. And that means that if, if God starts leading you in a direction and you start backing up thinking, I don't know if that's right or not, you're going the wrong way. Trust where God is leading you. And 
If you purpose your life to God's glory and you walk by faith in Jesus Christ, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you, when God is through, here's what's going to happen. The Lord Jesus is going to be glorified. Mm -hmm. And people are going to be blessed. And you're going to be blessed because you're going to find all your dreams coming true. And, and, and I want to explain exactly what I'm talking about here. Because I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about, um, I'm not trying to be up here and be a, 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 a you know, a, a life coach. I'm not trying to give you self-help hints here. I'm talking about the Word of God. I'm talking about your relationship to Jesus Christ. I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about, how God can take someone and, and knows what's in their heart and, and, and use them for his glory, gift them for his glory, yet at the same time fulfill the desires in their heart and bless them more than you could have ever imagined. When I was a young man in high school, even before high school, we were talking about Elvis today. It was probably Elvis that put this thought in my head. Young man in high school absolutely dreamed of being a rock star one day. I know a lot of kids have that dream. And um, I just wanted to be up in front of people. I wanted to be able to play my guitar. I wanted to be able to sing. And I took my favorite records, and I would put them on, and I could listen to music all day long just to imagining myself singing in front of people, being that guy. You know what, folks? My favorite group in high school was the Beatles. I wanted to be the fifth Beatle, right? I didn't have the hair, but but I always knew, in the back of my mind, it was nothing more than fantasy, even as a kid. Well, that's fantasy. Being a rock star was impossible. Not because it was. I was limited in my own mind, you see. It's not impossible. People do it all the time, right? But uh, I graduated from high school, joined the Army, got out of the Army, got married, had kids, and that dream that I had as a young man, it just kind of faded away like most of them do that we had when we were young, right? But then the Lord found me, 27 years old, and saved me. And you know what he did? He put a guitar in my hands. Yes, he did. Since I've been serving the Lord, I have stood up and played my guitar and sang before a whole host of people. Something I only dreamed would happen when I was a kid. God made that dream come true. He kind of changed the music I like. But he made that dream come true. Did he take a young man's dream and make it come true? Absolutely he did. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Being satisfied with God, uh, being satisfied with the Lord Jesus, with where you're at, where he's got you in life, but also where he's taking you. That leads to your dreams coming true. Because that is the nature of our God. Amen. Finally, godliness with contentment, being satisfied in life where you are, but also where God is taking you, that's applicable to every area in our lives. It applies to our physical provision. It applies to our spiritual growth. It applies to ministry and the opportunities of ministry, to blessings, but also it just applies everywhere in life. You can apply this to your marriage. It applies to your job. It applies to your family. Uh, it, it, most especially, it applies to our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I'm thinking about this, I ask myself this question. What if in any of these areas you're not content? And the problem doesn't lie within you. You are satisfied with where you're at. You're satisfied with where you're going. But there's the actions of others. There's the complacency in others. The apathy in others that is affecting you and living for Jesus. Well, there's nothing that you can do about other people's hang-ups affecting your life. Other than to pray and give them to God. See, you can only do what you can do, right? Amen. And as, as long as you're obedient to the word of God. As long as you're living by faith in Jesus Christ, you're honoring God, and you are moving forward and upward with Christ. If there's other people in your life that are causing you not to experience the best that God has for you, when it comes to these people, we pray. We pray. And we lift them up. And we ask the Holy Spirit 
to work in their lives. My dad used to pray that, that the Lord Jesus would strike people alive. It's usually the dead ones that are getting in the way, you see. Spiritually dead. And either he will. He will. He'll charge their batteries and they'll be right there with you. Or he'll give you grace to handle the situation because God is a God of grace. Or he'll step in and change the situation. That's all we can do. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness coupled with being satisfied with where you are, but also satisfied with where you're going, satisfied with where God is taking you. Because when you're a child of God, you're always going somewhere, amen? amen? When you're walking with Jesus, I promise you, you're always going somewhere good. Amen. Godliness with content, that type of content, that is great gain. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. I want to thank you for how you have designed the life that we live. Amen. And how you've given us life to live. And I pray for everyone that's in this auditorium this evening. That through this word that you've blessed us with. That they will lay hold on life. Mm -hmm. That they will grasp eternal life with all of their being. And that day by day. They will not endure life. They will live it to the full to your glory. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.